I'll give you, you know, a bird's eye view, which you might not appreciate. But what it means is that when I'm studying finite continuous transformations, I can do them as a product of small steps because we have learned how to compound interest in first two weeks of the course. So, you know, any, any group transformation can be thought of little steps. Now, every little step is a tangent space. So there is a group space, which is parameterized by these angles that we have, for example, three angles. And they're compact and periodic. So it's something like, a, you know, a sphere or a torus or something, some um, smooth surface on which these parameters live, phi one, two. And because of the symmetry, there is no preferred origin. You can decide that this is North Pole, but, you know, people in Israel can decide that they live on the North Pole, so, you know, their pole is there. Now, for everybody, the world looks locally flat, so there is this tangent space described by this thing. And to understand how you compound the little steps, because of the symmetry, it suffices to understand how it works around the North Pole, where the group element is one plus a small change. And that'll be true for every, everybody. So the Lie algebra uses the idea that all group elements are equivalent, and it suffices to expand things close to the origin and understand how the generators work. So that's, you know, geometrical picture of what this means. Now you might, you're free to ignore me if you like algebra, this is totally straightforward. What now happens for any continuous group, any, not just rotations in three dimensions, the same strategy that I just outlined works, which is you need closure, otherwise you don't have a group. It says that if I apply group operation in no matter what setting, you know, in thousand dimensions or three dimensions, and apply another group operations, that will be some group operation parameterized whatever coordinates I use on the Earth or, you know, to parameterize, let's say, three rotations or any number of them. And the way to understand how this works, now we don't have a simple, these parameters don't have a simple multiplication rule. You actually have to, you know, you have to compute these parameters on the curved space, let's say, around the black hole and general activity, whatever you are. And um, you do this by adding up infinitesimal elements. This is generalization of calculus, but to curved surfaces uh, uh, fell in non-trivial cases. And you do this by always starting at unity and taking little steps by the generators, and you demand the closure. You demand that the result is also a group element. And that leads you inevitable to a commutator. And you must have this structure. I take j infinitesimal direction. So you know what are these j's? I told you I have a tangent space, and this has some number of dimensions. The tangent and move in different direction, and they can be chosen orthogonal in these directions. So that's what J is doing. It's moving in one of these directions, followed by motion in the other direction. And the result must be infinitesimal motion of some kind. You know, there are all the stupid indices. So one takes 
a repeated index convention saying that the index appear at some of it, implicit in everything I'll write down. So this structure, any continuous transformation should have, any subgroup of SUN should have every complex group. And these guys are called structure constants. So now they play the same role as multiplication table played for finite groups. So structure constants are intrinsic to the group. They are abstract in a sense. They don't care about what realization, you know, what spaces these matrices are acting on. These guys also have the same structure. And these generators, you know, they're matrices, uh, but they're really a basis for um, uh, a general transformation in a group. Operators, sometimes they're differential operators, but right, you know, right now we always make the matrices. There, you can choose them to be an orthonormal basis for your parametrization. So your parametrization of generalized rotation is in terms of generator multiplied by a vector, each element being one possible direction. And um, orthonormal here means is if you take two generators and you multiply them, then if they're different, their trace will be zero. If they're the same, It'll be some almost like identity, but you know only on this uh, part of the rotation space, as you notice for these three rotations. But the trace will be well defined. It'll you know have ones or some numbers on diagonal, and we we'll take a trace. You'll get some number here if it's the same generator. And what number here you get is a convention. So you shouldn't take it too seriously. What happens when they teach you quantum mechanics, they first teach you Pauli matrices, which are rotations, cost rotations in two dimensions. And if you get to SU3 and particle physics, then they teach you Galman matrices, which are just the same in three dimensions. But you know, what this number is, it's just a convention. So for people like, Bar who know this kind of things, you know, the trace in this particular case will be, if I remember it correctly, is one half, but that's just a convention. That's not the important thing. The general structure of the problem you obtain in the following way, you take your commutator, So that's I, C, I, J, K. Then you multiply it by, you know, one of the generators. So this is L. So K is some, but this is just another generator. Then wash and repeat, you trace this. Both sides. Now, you know, when you trace this side, you use this rule, and you just get CIJK. When you trace this side, you have a trace of three matrices. So you get a formula for structure constants, which is the trace of TITJ multiplied by TL. Uh, we label it K, doesn't matter, minus these two guys in the other order. And then, you know, this thing had some normalization, so 1 over A shows up here, just from this trace. And you look at the form of this trace and you realize that in three dimensions, we had this thing, but you know, it could have been specific just to three dimensions. 
we had this thing that the Levy Civita tensor, which was very simple matrix, just had ones or zeros as values, uh, was fully anti-symmetric. So if I interchange any two indices, I get a minus sign. But this property carries on to any continuous Lie group, and you find that uh, structure constants have to be anti-symmetric under interchange of these two indices or the first two. So structure constant is all, always fully anti-symmetric. That's kind of nice because that decreases number of uh, interesting components because this tensor, you know, in principle, if you have n parameters could be of size n cube because it has three indices, but it's much smaller because anytime two indices repeated zero because of the anti-symmetry. So that's uh, now one property that structure constants have to satisfy for any group. Now, remember, how did we, I know you're totally mystified, I'm sorry, you'll have to study Dressel House or somebody to honestly learn it. But uh, remember how we solved the problems of all finite groups. The multiplication tables had so-called the regular representation in which the multiplication table itself was representation of the group. And that's an abstract representation of the group. Doesn't depend on, you know, whether I'm interchanging billiard balls or flipping triangles, you know, that's on the level of algebra. Same thing happens for structure constants. There is an abstract thing which is has incredibly ugly name. Blame it to on mathematicians, German ones. I don't even know what it means. It's called adjoint representation. So, you know, in physics and math, there are a few beautiful things that just are hampered by horrible names. So gauge theory is a beautiful, but what the hell is gauge? It's some, you know, 1920s idea that you, a German craftsman uses a special gauge meter to measure distances. So that's what I call gauge theory, totally stupid. Same with adjoint representation. I have no idea what it is, but it's really beautiful stuff. So the adjoint representation turns out that I can define a matrix with index i component j k just from this three tensor. So I can take all the values of the allowed parameters. So I have I components. And now, you know, every commutator is of this form. You know, I take my representation multiplied. But in this special case where the representation, this matrix can be written in terms of these components, you just write it out and you find out that C, C minus one order, other order. Uh, and then, you know, this I cancels because there is I here, so I get C, C. And then you stick in all these indices. So it turns out these totally abstract objects which generalize the notion of multiplication table for finite group to the structure constant uh, multiplication table for continuous groups. So they only depend on the group. They don't depend on particular space you work in because they describe how operations of the group uh, relate to each other. They satisfy the thing that's called Jacobi relation, which is usually very tedious because you have to make sure that you get all the signs right. These guys are anti-symmetric. I've written it as a commutator equals, uh, you know, closure. But you can write, you know, cyclically permit indices. And that is what continuous, any continuous Lie group has to satisfy. Now, for finite groups, we had multiplication.
position tables, you learn some tricks how to write character tables, but uh, that gets sophisticated. And it took from 1850 to 1960 or 70 something until one produced a list of all possible multiplication tables. Continuous groups as more rigid, you know, discrete things. You can put discrete things in many ways. Continuous group requires smoothness, and that makes it rigid. Like in case of complex uh, representation, you know, functions of complex variable, we had this amazing relations called Riemann-Cauchy because things had to be smooth. Same thing happens for these continuously groups, sub. Uh, unitary groups, and Killing in 1890 classified them all. And Cartan, uh, very brilliant uh, young French mathematician, wrote his PhD thesis in 94, in which he rewrote Killing and added to it in such a way that you today can read his thesis we use Cartan's notation. Everything is set by Cartan in 1894. And they solved the problem of finding all structure constants that, that can satisfy anti-symmetry of structure constant and Jacobi relation. And that's called classification of all the algebras. Now, if you know what else that's infinitesimal stuff, then you know some extra thought. You also know what are possible groups. That was people really had to do this once they invent quantum mechanics was invented. So Hermann Weil did important work on this in 1920s. But basically, for you know one or one century and a half, we know but all possible compact Lie groups. Uh, compact means where the parameters are uh, of order five. So to summarize, for continuous groups, the closure, meaning that you know, group operations close gets translated into the exponentiation of the thing, and you find out that the commutators of the generators must close using composition rule called Lie algebra. So instead of just multiplying generator, you have to take a commutator and then it closes. So that's the one big difference. Now, the abstract groups, classification groups, that's all contained in this structure constant, when they have to satisfy two properties, they have to be anti-symmetric, and they have to satisfy Jacobi, Jacobi relation. And I will not take us further in this course on this path because it's not needed. Now you understand the two essential ideas. What I'll do on Thursday, I'll show you a very surprising result that rotations are okay, but actually the smart thing is to rotate the complex. They'll have the same multiplication table. That is to say, the commutators of rotations were Levi-Civita tensors in this particular case for three-dimensional rotations. But it turns out two-dimensional complex number or SU2 group has the same multiplication table. So it represents rotations, and that's totally weird because, you know, we don't live in two-dimensional complex space. So what is this representation? Well, it's called spin one-half. Nature has chosen to have electrons, positrons in there, and it's there on classical level. You know, it's called quaternions or something and engineers have to use it to do computer games. So the good description of three dimension, it'll turn out is two dimension complex vectors. A big surprise. Now, 
I tried to compete with my mother who was a single mother and she had to feed a child and compete against men in history. So she created the new branch of uh, art history, which was, you know, doing the peasant uh, late Renaissance and uh, churches in Croatia and, you know, part of Europe. But there were no men doing it because it was a new thing. And she beat me to my PhD by one year, and I'm very proud of it. That's it. Now back to Vladimir. Uh, 